Okay, this sermon's entitled Conversions in the Bible. I'd like to open up with prayer, and then with a few verses, all right, Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says on this subject. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 111 reads, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. Now, the Bible gives many accounts of people you know, getting saved. And we can glean a lot of different information from a lot of these accounts. Let's start off with the account of uh, Cornelius, Acts chapter 10. It reads in verse 30, And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done, that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Now what this tells us is that evangelism is something God commands. It's not an arbitrary thing. It's not a random thing. It's something that God has ordained and God has commanded. Okay, in verse 34 it reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now that's teaching you, teaching us and whoever's reading this, and he's also teaching you know, Cornelius something about God. God is not a respecter of persons. God does not show favor towards some and not others. That's why salvation is a free gift offered to everyone equally. All right, verse 35 reads, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of, of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now, of course, this is pre-evangelism here. But what this tells us is that whenever we preach the gospel, which is the message of peace, the message of hope, the message of eternal life, it says right here that um, that God, or Jesus Christ, is with us. It says, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. So it's not something that people are doing on their own, by themselves. And then it goes on to say, in verse 37, that word I say, ye know which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, okay, whom they, they slew and hanged on a tree. God, oh, him God raised up the third day and shoot him openly. Now what we have here is an example of you know the gospel being preached. Okay, verse forty one it says, Not okay, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, and he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. Verse forty three reads to give or excuse me, to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now, this is when he he just makes it very clear on salvation. You simply believe on Jesus Christ, and you receive, you know, full remission of all sins. All your sins are paid for. Okay, verses 44 and 45 are, um, basically, that's when, I believe, Cornelius is converted, according to lots of commentaries. But either way, as we finish out the chapter, we'll see that they were all sent to be baptized, and of course, if they were not a believer in Christ, they would, they would not be baptized. So let's continue with, with verse 44, and I'll stop at verse 48. It reads, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water, that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him 
to tarry certain days. So in verse uh, 45, it says they believed. So that, that that's basically the conversion of Cornelius. Now let's take a look at some other conversions. Let's go back to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, and look at verse, let's see, verse 22. This is the, the uh, conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. It reads, we'll start off at verse 22, and then we'll stop at verse uh, 37. It reads, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be, may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity, then answered Simon and, and said, Pray ye to the Lord for, for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under you know, Candace, queen of, <clears throat> of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. Now, this is referring to reading the book of Isaiah. In verse 29 it reads, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself, to this chariot, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read, you know, the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. And that, of course, is Isaiah chapter 53, Verses 7 and 8. Okay, verse 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. It's talking about Jesus Christ. He gave his life for us. That's what it's referring to. And verse 34 says, And the eunuch <clears throat> answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself, or of some other man, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So then that's where Philip was explaining the gospel. Okay, verse 36. And as they, as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doeth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now obviously... Baptism is not part of salvation, but you have to be saved before you get baptized, and that's why he explains you need to believe on Christ. And he says, I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that would be his conversion. Now, let's take a look at uh, the Apostle Paul. Let's turn, we could look at Acts chapter 9, but we can also see like a, oh, another version of this in Acts chapter 22. Let's go ahead and look at Acts chapter 22. It starts off in verse 1. It says, <clears throat> Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I, which I make now unto you. <clears throat> and when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this day at the feet of, of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Now, what this tells us is that the Apostle Paul was already zealous, so-called. He was what you would call religious. But it does not mean he was saved at this point. See, religion cannot save. You can try to ad adhere to all these laws. You could try to you know, obey the Ten Commandments all you want, and it's not going to save you. So what we see here is an example of somebody religious getting saved, you know, okay, let's start back up in verse um, 4. It says, And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into, per into prisons both men and women, and also the high priest doeth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, 
from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were <clears throat> there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that <clears throat> were with me saw indeed the light, but were, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise, and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Okay, verse 11, And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. Now pause for a second. Pretty much in every one of these accounts, there's always some messenger involved. This tells us that God it needs to send people out to preach the gospel. We've, we've seen it so far in both accounts. So that's why this is so important. That's why soul winning is so important. Let's continue with verse... I believe we're at verse uh, 13. Came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him, and he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now this is when the conversion took place. Obviously you had to believe on Jesus Christ to call upon him. Okay, and that's when he got his sins washed away, and that is synonymous to salvation. So now let's take a look at the account of the uh, Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, let's start off with verse 26. It reads, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, <clears throat> he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake <clears throat> unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and his straightway, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now this is a very straightforward conversion. The question was asked, and the answer was given, and the answer was a very, you know, laconic answer. It's not, you know, what must I do to be saved? Well, the world would tell you, repent of your sins. <clears throat> what must I do to be saved? You know, repent and be baptized. What must I do to be saved? Do the good works, live the good life, surrender it all to Christ. What must I do to be saved? You know, ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart. Those are all the wrong answers. The correct answer is right there. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So now, very straightforward conversion. Now let's take a look at the conversion of <clears throat> the woman of Samaria. Turn over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Start off with verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, 
and it was about the sixth hour, that would be about noon, 12 o'clock. <clears throat> okay, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, this was the perfect opportunity to evangelize, and he actually made it as clear as he could make it. <clears throat> He's explaining that people, when people are lost, they are thirsty for salvation. He's also explaining that it's a gift. It's the gift of God. And then he's explaining that it's, it's, a, it's, one, it's one singular drink of this water, and you'll be saved forever. You'll have living water. And then it goes on again with the concept of God giving, you know, the gift. So he's, he's explaining salvation very clearly in this verse. Verse 11, The woman saith unto her, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? which gave us the well, and drank thereof, himself, and his children, and his cattle. Now, what's going on here is that we, were, we are seeing that she's not understanding that it's, it's not literal water. It's, it's spiritual water. <clears throat> and he's going to explain that it's, the water is it's eternal. It's not like regular drinking water. But when a person is not saved, they don't understand stuff like this. They don't understand spiritual things. <clears throat> So let's keep reading. Verse 13 reads, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Let's stop right there. What he's teaching is eternal security. <clears throat> He's telling them that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. In other words, you'll be saved forever. Well, let's go ahead and skip ahead to where the actual conversion took place. And in this case, the conversion was multiple. Lots of Samaritans got saved here. Verse 39 reads, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them... <clears throat> And he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now this would be an example of planting seeds. Sometimes when you give the gospel to somebody, they won't believe it right away. But because you planted that seed, somebody else may come along and water it, and explain it again, and that's why it says, we didn't believe when you told us, but we believe now, after we heard his own word. So this is an example of planting seeds. So once again, we see another conversion, and we see how simple the conversions are. Notice in all these accounts, it says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him. Doesn't say anything about repenting. Doesn't say anything about changing. Doesn't say anything about anything else. It just says believe. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at Nicodemus. And this is an interesting story as well, where Jesus Christ is evangelizing. And the reason I'm preaching this sermon is to give people the biblical understanding of evangelism and conversions, because the best way to understand it is to see exactly how it was done in the Bible. How did Jesus Christ evangelize? How did Paul and Silas evangelize? How did all the characters evangelize? Well, they, they had lots of different ways. And a lot of these different stories, the reason why they differ is because each story is giving another facet about salvation. <clears throat> In one sense, we see where it's, it talks about the remission of sins. In another sense, we see where it talks about calling upon the name of the Lord. Then we see the reception of the gift of life. And now we see the concept of being born again. So each one of these stories is telling us something else about salvation. John chapter 3, verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, or unto thee, Ye must be born again. <clears throat> He's not talking about being an adherent to all these laws. He's not talking about being religious. He's not talking about being pharisaical or being a religious leader. He's not talking about doing works. He says you must be born again. And he's, he's, letting, he's letting people know, letting Nicodemus know, this is important. Everyone must be born again if they want to go to heaven. But see, he's going to explain the gospel here, and then he's going to tell, how, how, he's going to tell us how do we get born again. He makes it very clear. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that <clears throat> we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Now, it doesn't matter how smart somebody is. <clears throat> You could be, you know, a scholar and know a lot of worldly things. But when it comes to something that's biblical, you know, you, it takes, you know, a spiritual understanding. That's why Nicodemus did not get this. Because this was a foreign concept to him. Being born again didn't make sense because this was, this was something spiritual. But now he's going to go on to tell us the gospel story in verse 13. He's basically likening this or making a verisimilitude out of the story that took place in the book of Numbers when people were getting snake-bitten. So let's continue with verse 13. It says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, he's, what he's explaining there is the fact that he's the only way. No one else has come down from heaven, and no one else is going to ascend, is going to ascend back into heaven. He's the only one. <clears throat> now, verse 14 is where he explains the gospel. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's a picture of him being put on the cross and then lifted up so that everyone can see you know, that he died on the cross. Then it goes on to say in verse 15 and 16, it tell, he tells Nicodemus twice how to be born again. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What he's saying is that if you believe on Jesus Christ, you will be born again, and being born again results in having everlasting life that never ends at the moment you're born again. And it's by simply believing on Christ. He doesn't just put the picture out there and say, well, you must be born again. Or he put, put the concept out there. He puts it out there and then explains you know, believe, just like we've, we've seen in all these other accounts of giving the gospel. You know, believe on him, and then you're saved. So that's another example of, uh, of evangelism coming straight out of the Bible. Now let's turn over to John chapter 11 and look at one more account. And the reason why this is so important is, is because a lot of people ask, them, they ask themselves, or they ask their pastor, or they ask some other Christian, how do we evangelize? Well, the best way to do it is how, is how Jesus did it. You know, what, did, what, did he, what words did he use? <clears throat> you know, how did he explain it? And we see lots of examples. One more example would be John chapter 11. Let's look at the story of Lazarus. It says in verse 11, These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Now once again, it's a spiritual matter. It's not to be taken literally. Verse 14, Then said Jesus unto them, Plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had 
lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, <clears throat> and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast, hast been there, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last time. Now this basically confirms that she did not doubt that God saves. She didn't doubt you know, a person's salvation. And then Jesus, in verse 25, evangelizes very clearly here. He says, you know, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now notice once again, as we've already seen in John 4, and in various other places, that Jesus Christ is teaching eternal security. He says that the one who believes on me shall never die. <clears throat> she believes on him, and she believes in eternal security as well. So you, we don't leave that out of evangelism. That's very important. <clears throat> so like I said, we need to take these accounts, and we should use them as a, a paradigm or a model as we evangelize. You know, we need to keep it simple, keep it clear. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He came to this earth to die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. He shed his blood and suffered on our behalf. He was, he was, he was nailed to the cross. He died, was buried, rose again. That's the crucifixion. And then the fact that he did this lets us know that eternal life is a gift. It's free. <clears throat> and the Bible tells us, in order to receive this gift, we just have to simply believe on Jesus Christ. John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Salvation's all by grace. It's all of God. And it's just simply by faith alone in Christ alone. There's nothing else. And that's what the Bible teaches. And we see this, we see this all over the place. All these examples of people just simply believing on Christ. And then they're saved forever. So that's all I have with biblical conversions. I'd like to close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your clear word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>